So before we begin our sermon this morning, I just uh, wanted to take a moment and say, when Jen was naming all of the different areas of laity and um, people were standing up, if you didn't stand up, um, one, I'm going to assume you're just being modest. Um, because there isn't a single person here at the church that isn't involved in some sort of ministry in some way. Um, and so thank you from the bottom of my heart that you are involved in them. Um, this is our ministry together. This is not my ministry alone, okay? So thank you for being involved in ministry. Uh, this week we will conclude our series on what we expect uh, when we move forward as being disciples of Jesus. Over the past four weeks, we've been talking about different things that we encounter as disciples of Jesus. Uh, our first week, we talked about being in action, uh, not just complaining about our problems, uh, and how we need to, in the next week, we talked about making sure that we turn the other cheek. And last week, we talked about devoting ourselves to be in study of the Word of God so that we don't get led down a path of confusion. Well, this week, we're going to talk about our need for introspection as followers of Jesus. So what does that mean? What does it mean to uh, be introspective in your following of Jesus? Well, it means that we need, at times, to be looking inward and how we are living our lives. Now, you are no doubt thinking to yourself, Pastor, you spend a lot of time preaching on how we need to be looking outward as a people and outward as followers of Jesus. Don't you often tell us about our need to look into the world and see those that need help and to then be in action in helping them? Don't you often preach upon our need to take the gospel of Jesus to others? And if that is the case, then how can you tell us today that we also need to be looking inward at ourselves? Now, maybe you're thinking back to your childhood uh, when your parents might have yelled at you as you went in and out of the house a hundred times. Pick one already. You're either in or you're out. Maybe you guys didn't hear that growing up. I, I did several times. Um, but you're, you're right. I do often preach on our need to be looking outward, but we must also at times be looking inward as Christians. See, we need to make sure that what we are doing and the why of what we are doing so that when we look into our hearts and see why we are doing things, we become more effective as Christians. Now, as I spoke about last week, one facet of introspection needs to be our reading and considering of scripture. And in our sermon last week, we discussed about our need to make sure we're not throwing out the Old Testament when it comes to our studies. And you no doubt noticed that our scriptures for last week and this week, we do find ourselves in the book of Exodus from the Old Testament. Well, again, there is just so much for us to take from those scriptures and indeed, we are told in 2 Timothy from the New Testament, uh, uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we are told that all scripture is from God, and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And that comes from the NIV version. I know that some people like only one translation when they're reading scripture. Uh, some people love the King James Version. Um, they will tell you that it's the only uh, version, right, Dean? That all the other versions are just uh, uh, remakes of the King James, right? Yeah. And, and you know, some people like the message, a very modern interpretation of Scripture. Um, and, and to read the two side by side, they, are, they come across as quite different, but they are saying the same things. Uh, for me, when I study, I like the one that makes the most sense to me as I'm reading it. Uh, and in this particular scripture, I like the New Living Testament description, uh, uh, um, interpretation of it. And it says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. See, I like that translation because it gets right to the heart of things. The Bible is the word of God and is given to us so that we know what it is we should be doing in our lives 
and what it is that we should not be doing in our lives. You know, it's often said, and I know you've heard this a million times in your life, that God works in mysterious ways, right? You hear that all the time. And while that is true, uh, sometimes God tells you exactly what he means. Sometimes he is very direct in what he is saying. And in our scripture for today, we find God being very direct with Moses. As Moses is on the mountain meeting with God for instructions, the Israelites are getting restless in the valley. And they begin to complain to Aaron, we need a God to worship while Moses is away. I mean, is Moses even coming back, Aaron? He's been up there for a long time. Uh, and we need a God to worship. So give us one, Aaron. And Aaron relents to the pressure of the people and fashions for them a golden calf so that they have an idol to worship. Have you ever wondered why a golden calf? Does that thought ever cross your mind? If you're going to build a statue to worship, why, why a cow? Now, if you're a farmer, maybe you're thinking, oh, okay, sure, a cow. Uh, but if you're not, why a golden calf? Well, remember the people had just been freed from slavery in Egypt, and in Egypt there were many gods that were represented by the statue of a calf. For the Egyptians, that calf symbolized strength and fertility. So the golden calf was a familiar symbol to the people of Israel. It was almost as if they were saying by Aaron fashioning that calf for them, let's forget it all about what God has done for us. Let's forget about how he's carried us out of slavery. We need something that we can see right in front of our faces to worship. Well, of course, this decision does not go well for them. When God sees what they are doing, he lets Moses know right away what they are doing. And he tells them, tells Moses, I am going to destroy the Israelites. But I'm going to spare you, Moses. I'm going to make a great nation out of you, Moses. Well, that sounds like a familiar promise, doesn't it? I will make a great nation out of you and your descendants. It is the same promise that God had made to Abraham previously. But now he is saying to Moses, I will fulfill this promise, but I will fulfill it through you and you alone. And Moses pleads with God not to destroy the people, reminding him of all that he has already done for them. And telling God that if you destroy them here in the desert, our enemies will simply look at you and say that you are a vengeful God, an evil God. You brought them out of Egypt just to destroy them in the desert. And ultimately, God changed his mind, and he does not destroy the people, though there is a price for them to pay for what they have done. So my question for you to think about in all of this that is going on with the Israelites is this. Do you think that this all could have been avoided? Do you think that the Israelites could have spared themselves from almost being destroyed in this instance by God? Well, I hope that you have arrived to the conclusion, because it is a quick one to come to, and, and that is yes. This all could have easily been avoided. It could have been avoided by the people not asking Aaron to build them a golden calf in the first place. And how could they have done that? Well, they could have, how could they have stopped it before it even began? The answer is simple here. It all could have been avoided. If the people of Israel had just taken some time to really think about what they were doing and feeling in those moments while Moses was on the mountain. If they simply would have had a bit of introspection in their lives, it could have been avoided. See, what if in the moments where they were fearing God and Moses had abandoned them, instead of looking to elevate something in their lives to the level that only God can claim, they would have simply thought, you know what? Yeah, Moses has been gone for a while, but think of all God has already done for us. He led us out of slavery. He stopped Pharaoh's army from coming and destroying us. And he has fed us and given us water in the desert. Surely, if we continue to trust in him, he will continue to take care of us. Let's just be a little bit patient here. See, with a little bit of introspection, that near destruction that happened to them could have all been avoided. Now, I think 
An interesting thing to point out here in this scripture, it is found in our last verse from 32, 14. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. That does not read Moses changed the Lord's mind. It does not read Mo uh, the Lord was testing Moses. It reads the Lord changed his mind. Has it ever occurred to you that God is introspective as well? Meaning God considered one thing, thought about it, and decided against it because it was for the betterment of his people. We don't often think of God in those terms. We often think of God in simple cause and effect terms, right? People sin, God punishes. People need a savior, God sends one. Well, as always, I think God is so much more than we can possibly understand ourselves. But I do believe we can look at this scripture and think of it as an introspection or a self-searching moment that God has. Well, we as Christians, we need to be doing the same thing in our own lives. Looking inward at what and why we believe what we believe. Now, maybe... You're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not a very introspective person, Pastor. I don't really consider things. The kids would say, I'm all gas and no brakes, right? I'm just react, go, 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 go all the time. Maybe that is your personality, but I promise you, you're inter more introspective than you think you are. And I can prove it pretty quickly. Have you ever bought a car? Yes, I know each and every one of you has bought a car. In the process of buying a car, do you just walk on the lot and go, I want that one, and then walk away? No, probably not, right? You think about, oh, what features does it have? How much is it actually going to be? Can I tow this with it? Can I pull that with it? Um, do I like the way that it drives? All of these things, right? You have to take time to consider it. Well, our lives and our, our work with Christ is no different. See, we have to consider the reasons why we believe in Jesus and why we want to follow his word in the first place. Because when we do that, it can help us avoid making mistakes in our lives. See, when we combine an introspective nature with the word of God, we are able to truly understand how the Bible can be used for teaching and helping us to avoid those problems in our lives. So when we consider the reasons why we want to follow Jesus, it becomes easier for us to do so as well. If we look at the three problems that we discussed over the last month, complaining without action, turning the other cheek and allowing ourselves to become confused or misled, if we think of it in terms of these three problems and why we want to follow Jesus, it becomes easier for us to avoid all of those mistakes. I want to follow Jesus because he showed me how to be in action instead of just complaining. Did Jesus just stand by when he saw things that were wrong and look at the state of the world and say, you know what, someone should do something about this? No. He went out and he did something about it. He helped others everywhere that he went. Did Jesus fight back in anger when he was provoked? No, he's the ultimate example of what it means to turn the other cheek and to love your enemies. And did Jesus allow himself to become confused by what so-called experts were teaching on scriptures? No, he was daily in scripture himself and taught them the truth of the word of God. So if we are his disciples, then what does that mean for us? Well, if we really think about, think about it, it means that if we are trying to follow him the best that we can, we're doing our best to emulate him in all that we do, right? If we think about that first, before we react to any situation, if we take time to be introspective, if we say to ourselves, what is it that Jesus would do in this situation? we can become much more effective as his disciples. So let us strive to be a people that Jesus would be proud to call his disciples. My challenge for you is not just for this week, but for your entire life. 
In all things, I want you to ask yourself, what is it that Jesus would do in this situation I am facing? And then do your best to follow through as he would. Amen.